Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at Nassau Community College, along with Nassau Community College student, Gina Peter. And today we're going to talk about dentistry and the questions you may be afraid to ask your dentist, especially concerning the COVID pandemic. Our guest today is Dr. Bruce Villari, the Chief Dental Officer and Director of Prosthodontics at ProHealth Dental. Dr. Villari, welcome to your family's health on the voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I hope you're doing well in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Has this virus affected you personally at all? Um, only indirectly, fortunately. Okay. I think we all know people either directly or indirectly that have had, you know, exposure and or illness relative to this uh, virus that we've all been managing over these last several months. But fortunately, nothing too, too close to me. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about yourself. What made you want to get into dentistry? So um, I, this is my 37th year in, in clinical practice. Um, my father uh, was a dentist. Um, he was a specialist in both prosthodontics, which is my specialty, which most people don't really um, understand what it means, but it's one of the nine uh, recognized specialties by the American Dental Associations. And it deals with restorations, whether it be um, replacing single tooth or all teeth or volumes of tissue as necessary. I'm also a maxillofacial prosthodontist. I do facial prosthesis for patients that have lost portions of their um, patients uh, from their palates or um, from their ears or eyes or noses, be primarily because the materials are plastic materials, and, and that's why dentists, uh, it's a subspecialty. So my dad was a maxillofacial prosthodontist and an oral and maxillofacial surgeon way back when in the mid-50s when you could do your training in about five years after graduating from dental school. My training was four years after dental school. And um, not, that, not that you go into, like you, if my father owned a candy store, I'd work in the store, but I didn't actually go into the office. But he would come home and kind of share the events of his days. And it was kind of very interesting to hear what he was doing, a little bit of arts and crafts and more so about the patient care. And um, my oldest brother's a plastic surgeon and my middle brother's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. So we kind of it took all three of us to do what my father does. Um, he was one of the founding members of the Plastic Surgery Institute at NYU. And um, so I think it was that familial connection that piqued my interest in dentistry. Um, I had a number of very, um, very significant mentors along the way. So um, it's a career path that I certainly would recommend strongly um, to anyone that has an interest in taking care of people and doing some some very exciting uh, things. The technology that, that we work with today is worlds different from what I started with when I was in dental school. So tell us about ProHealth Dental. How many locations do you have and how long has ProHealth Dental been around? So we currently have nine locations um, in Long Island, Queens, Westchester, and New Jersey. Um, we're a very unique group. I've been with ProHealth since, uh, since it was uh, started. Um, I was teaching actually at the time when one of my, my dental school classmates and, and good friends, uh, Neil Karnofsky, who's a periodontist, uh, had this vision of creating the type of practice that we've established through ProHealth. And, and what that is, is that all of our offices are either affiliated or associated with large healthcare systems or medical groups. Um, we work very closely. Our, our mission is to educate patients, physicians, and dentists into the importance of upper oral health care and its impact on systemic health. Um, we create literature that we share, um, different medias, 
that we share this information and we promote how important it is to have proper oral health care. And, and in COVID, in particular, there's been quite a lot written about the, the impact of patients that may not have what's referred to as comorbidities and how much better they seem to do with, if they catch the vir- virus, what their recovery and recuperation is like. So, you know, that's our model. Um, we have uh, specialty care in all of our offices. We have uh, many very talented dentists of varying degrees of experience. Um, everybody is well-oriented staff-wise to our mission. Um, we offer a variety of screening um, protocols for patients, help, hopefully to help identify if they may or may not have any of the concerns that we talk about with oral health and its impact, such as oral cancer screening and head and neck exams, which are very commonplace in a dentist's office. But, you know, again, it's something that, that we don't take lightly because early diagnosis is really the most effective way of treating any kind of disease process. Uh, we also do blood pressure um, as well as um, pulse oximetry. Um, it can identify if there are any pulmonary issues and any cardiac issues. And we also do what's known as cardiac rhythm strips or a STAT EKG. Um, so we record all this information. If a patient has a primary care physician or, or a cardiologist, we share that information. If it's something that our readings are um, abnormal, then we share it immediately. If patients do not have primary care physicians, then we would refer them to one of our affiliate um, medical staff people so that we can have a proper, again, proper workup and and care for those patients. We also do, um, we also, one of our areas of of specialty is is sleep disorders. So we have a sleep disorder screening. Um, There are a variety of, of, again, systemic conditions, whether it's diabetes, um, hypertension relative to sleep disorders, and as well as cardiovascular disease. And, uh, and so those are some of the critical screening protocols that we've instituted uh, and that we practice uh, to better care for our patients. So how does this work? If uh, you have a person who comes to the pro-health office, um, is, do you have a general practitioner who's there um, who does the initial uh, head-to-toe assessment of the patient and then goes to a spe- specialized, um, like yourself, a prostodontist or a periodontist, et cetera? Um, how does it work? How do you but, make? And again, that's that's very common commonplace for um for any general practitioner, so we have um, all of our all of our um, clinicians uh, go through a, a privileging, uh, credentialing type of, of evaluation. Some have taken continuing education courses. Um, basically, in dental school, you learn how to do everything, but um, not necessarily to the same level of proficiency and competency. And, and usually, you limit yourself to what you do well and efficiently. So we go through the process of screening our clinicians and, and identifying their areas of strength. And we support them where they may need to be doing the referrals on a more regular basis, whether it's with any of those areas that you mentioned, uh, whether it's a root canal um, and, and or if they needed some more comprehensive restorative treatment that's, again, beyond their scope of abilities. So we are able to support them uh, in any which way to provide the optimal level of care for all of our patients. And, uh, and that's, that's, again, part of our, our model to provide um, that kind of care. And we have dentists that, that run uh, the degree of, um, you know, few years of experience to many years of experience. And uh, each one has their own benefit to our patient populations. And we see that the, the younger ones are being mentored. Um, and, uh, and that's how we, we work. We also have the ability because all of our offices are networked through our um, database software that we can do real-time consults uh, with the dentists um, in terms of reviewing treatment plans as well as um, radiographs or images of a particular patient to have that conversation just like doing a consultation um, literally um, together. And so that's the service we're able to provide so that we work very closely together, even though as we're growing, because we're opening actually more offices um, in the in the next couple of months in Westchester, New Jersey, 
um, as we're growing regionally, then uh, this makes for a, a, a very efficient way of doing consults um, between clinicians. Okay. Um, so what are some basic changes that um, someone might experience when coming to the dentist um, now that the pandemic has hit? So we spent, um, we were open during the, during the mandated shutdown uh, to provide emergency cares. Uh, we had uh, several of our offices open uh, to care for those patients that truly had emergent problems. Um, which we found to be uh, very, very helpful and effective, and at least very comforting. We also instituted teledentistry during that time. So we provided, again, that, that level of service to our patients. Um, so so that's, that's one of the things in terms of, of care. Um, during the shutdown, we basically spent our time preparing to reopen and preparing to reopen um, safely. Um, not just for our patients, but certainly for our staff. And, uh, and that was what the focus was. We, we worked very hard. Our management team uh, supported tremendously. We did uh, basically an analysis of, of what we felt we needed um, in terms of our PPE to provide the proper armamentarium for our clinicians and our staff to be prepared to, to go back to work whenever that was going to be. Um, and, and so we developed our own clinical protocols, our administrative protocols, based on guidance from the CDC, uh, New York State Department of Health, as well as the American Dental Association. Um, we also embarked on um, evaluating different types of air filtration systems. Uh, if you're not familiar with the issues with um, the COVID um, virus, it uh, it primary transmission is is through uh, the air through aerosols and in dentistry during doing procedures you can generate uh, quite a lot of aerosol the question is how long is it staying in the air and so um, through the research and, and look, looking at different types of ways to help mitigate um, the aerosol production um, through our management team support we were able to obtain um, these very high volume suction units uh, that are filter, filter the um, the air with uh, UV and HEPA filters. They're very efficient and they're very effective. Um, and again, we stab- established uh, a very routine and um, thoughtful protocol for how rooms are cleaned, how the uh, reception area is cleaned, um, how we communicate with our patients. All of this information in terms of our protocol is on our website. But so some of the major changes were, um, you know, first of all, informing our patients as to what we're doing. So, you know, there's a lot of fear as there is with the unknown. And certainly the, the COVID virus presented, you know, a whole group of unknowns to all of us, not just in healthcare, but in our everyday lives. And so um, we created, um, you know, a, a reasonable way to communicate what we were doing. We felt that it's important to tell our patients what we were doing and why we're doing it. And so all of our patients are screened um, in advance um, about their COVID, you know, have they been exposed? Have they tested positive? Have they traveled? As as the travel ban um, has changed, um, it's kind of been an ebb and flow. Um, Now we're on a a major, um, major group number of uh, states that, that are on the list. Um, but we provide that information to all of our offices on a, on a uh, ever-changing basis, as well as we monitor all the recommendations from the CDC and the New York State Department of Health, as well as the ADA. So we've modified our, our, our protocols from day one, and, and they're a dynamic, fluid document, and we continue to, to monitor and uh, frequently and routinely. So um, so what we do differently, So so we, again inform our patients they're going to be uh, asked to wear a mask to social distance in our offices, which the majority of ones have parking lots uh, that they come into. They'll be asked to wait in their cars until we're ready to see them in the treatment room so that they're not congregating in the reception area. Um, We will take their temperatures when they enter the office. Um, If any of those things uh, bring red flags, then they're essentially reappointed, dismissed, and, uh, and whether hopefully in advance of the appointment, so it's less of an inconvenience for them, 
but we don't want to expose unnecessarily um, our staff and or other patients to patients that may, may be um, positive for COVID. Um, patients are brought into the room. Um, the staff and dentists um, are, depending on the procedures, are basically covered with the scrubs and or gowns, depending on the nature of the procedure, uh, that initially were disposable, but PPE is scarce. And now we have a laundry service, so we change uh, our, our gowns and, their, and the laundry takes care of them, again, to the highest standards of, of disinfecting. And, um, and so we wear, um, uh, we wear um, masks, the N95 masks. We actually wear a regular surgical mask, a level three mask over that N95 mask. And that's to preserve the longevity of the N95 mask because, again, there's in scarce supply and our concern certainly as things are ramping up that they may be in much, much greater scarce supply going forward. So we want to protect the integrity of that mask because that's really one of the critical barriers to uh, contracting the COVID. Um, we wear glasses or goggles and a face shield. And, um, and, and basically the patients are informed of all this prior to coming in. Um, they see what, what we are, so we don't want to frighten the patients, um, but they have to understand that this is for everyone's safety. Uh, we take the patient's masks as they present. Uh, we put them in a, in a bag to keep them clean. They're given safety goggles. They're asked to rinse with a mixture of water and uh, hydrogen peroxide. And what that does is it reduces the viral load of the virus if, in fact, it's in their mouths. Uh, it's very effective. It's been shown to be very effective. And that's what we've been doing and will continue to do um, going forward. Um, and then um, and then we would proceed with the procedure as we would normally do. Um, and then when the patient's dismissed, um, they're directed to the front. We, we have very, very limited um, paper. Um, again, we don't want um, to contaminate surfaces that don't need to be managed. So we don't have paper in the reception area. We don't have magazines out. Um, you know, all those things are, are gone um, for this point in time. And then, um, and then the room is, um, is, is disinfected. If it's a room that had a, an aerosol type procedure, meaning if we picked up a handpiece or if the hygienist picked up a, a, a ultrasonic scaler, um, if any of those things, or if we're using a three-way syringe, kind of that, uh, that, um, that water gun that we use, um, those are procedures that will potentially generate aerosol that will bring the virus from the environment of the mouth into the air. And during any of those procedures, we use that high volume suction unit that we spoke about earlier. And, um, and so um, that unit is left to run for a couple minutes because it continues to filter itself. And then the room is sprayed um, in a particular manner so that whatever particles may be in the air will be um, falling to the ground because the spray not only has a disinfectant in it, but it also adds weight to the particles. And then, um, and then uh, all the surfaces, we wait uh, 15 minutes and then we go back in and all the surfaces are wiped down with the same disinfectant. Um, and then allowed to uh, to dry. Uh, you don't dry the surfaces after you wipe them. They're allowed to air dry. And then the room is then set up as we would normally do for the next procedure. Um, all the instruments are treated the same way. So I, I've been in this uh, dental world for enough years that I actually did my specialty training during the AIDS crisis. So we're in dental school, so only certain procedures, you would wear gloves and a mask, usually surgical procedures. Uh, when the AIDS crisis hit in the in the uh, early mid '80s, um, we all developed a different protocol at that time, which involved gloves and masks and what's referred to as universal precautions. And from that point on, that's how all of us practiced. And so, when COVID hit, um, for dentists like myself that had lived through that period of time, this was kind of a modification, obviously for the dentists who didn't have that experience and certainly had the, you know, were, were comfortable wearing gloves and masks, this was now, uh, again, a whole new new world uh, for them to kind of adjust to, as, as we all have. And, and most importantly, uh, trying to provide comfort uh, for our patients is, is really what's most important and allowing to do the procedures that we need to do to carry on in, in, the, in the world that we live in. 
You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard, along with NASA Community College student Gina Peter. And today we're talking about dentistry and the questions you may be afraid to ask your dentist, especially concerning the COVID pandemic with Dr. Bruce Valari, the Chief Dental Officer and Director of the Prodontics at ProHealth Dental. So uh, let's move on to some topics people may be afraid to ask um, their dentists about. Let's start with the topic of halitosis, bad breath. What causes it and what can be done about it? So there, there, there are two likely issues with halitosis. One is Again, we can't stress the importance of proper oral health and, uh, and, and the health of, of the um, periodontal tissues, the gum tissues. Uh, it's, it's critically important, um, again, to your systemic health because there are a whole variety, as I mentioned earlier, of uh, systemic conditions, cardiovascular disease. Early onset Alzheimer's has also been identified uh, relative to uh, to periodontal pathogens or the bacteria that that's that's really abundant in in a uh, unhealthy mouth um, and certainly uh, as per the question um, there is a uh, an odor or an aroma that will result from really poor oral hygiene uh, you may have teeth that are decaying um, the bacteria again that's 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 become opportunistic will cause cavities um, it will cause inflammation and potentially infection uh, in and around the bone and, and the gum tissue, and all of that needs to be managed. And that really is the focus, uh, again, of our mission, to educate the patients, to provide that level of care, um, and, and to take care because, again, it has a huge impact. The other, the other um, area that may have a, have a contribution to halitosis is, is diet. Um, typically, people that have a more aromatic diet, um, you know, spices, um, foods like onions and garlic, um, literally they will get um, a greater uh, aroma essentially that, uh, that will present from their intake uh, on a regular basis. Um, and so those are the two areas. So how do you combat that? Um, obviously modify your diet. Maybe that shouldn't be the thing you're eating constantly. It should be an occasional thing. Uh, or you just have to accept that it may have an impact on, on your breath and how it smells. But um, primarily, it's it's oral oral health, and um, again, proper proper cleaning, and making sure that um, the teeth are sound uh, without decay. Um, how about yellow teeth? What causes yellow teeth? And you know, the over the counter things that they have are um, teeth whitening. Are those helpful at all? If your tooth are a particular color and then they become discolored, it may be from surface staining. Um, if you have a habit of tea and coffee and, um, and anything heavily pigmented, red wine, colas, um, smoking is a big contributor to staining of teeth. Over-the-counter products, I'm not going to endorse any, but they, they have basically an impregnated strip with a gel and now of different concentrations. And you can basically place it over the teeth and depending on the concentration for a prescribed amount of time with repeated applications, it will whiten the color of your teeth. So products that don't stay on the tooth for very long, which are transient, whether it be a mouth rinse or a toothpaste, are much, much less effective in whitening the color of the teeth. And so you need to have that surface contact. And the more intimate the contact is, and the more long-lasting it is, then the more effective the whitening process is going to be. If someone hasn't seen the dentist since March, uh, since before the pandemic, and just afraid because of corona to come out, how long should you wait before your next dental appointment? Should you immediately make a dental appointment because it's been a long time? And how often should you see the dentist? You should absolutely make an appointment. And again, I can only speak for our offices and that we again, have established and, and follow these very strict protocols for health and safety and disinfection, which, again, is what most people's fears are. Obviously, if you haven't left your house since March, um, you know, it's, it's, you're going to be more reluctant to, to come out. But um, our environments are safe. Um, as I described earlier, uh, the protocols that we provide um, ensure that. And so it's really important that patients come out um, at, uh, to have uh, proper dental uh, cleaning and exam, oral hygiene and oral health, 
is so important. Um, there's a recent study that was uh, presented, again, relative to COVID, that um, proper oral health or, or lack thereof may have an impact on your response if you do contract the COVID uh, virus. Um, again, if you are, um, if you're compromised, then the effect may be significant. And what we're talking about is really inflammation that occurs not just in the gum tissue, but that bacteria that does have an effect on creating inflammation in other areas of, of, of our bodies. And so if in fact that's what's occurring uh, because of poor oral hygiene, then you may have this comorbidity at a low level, but it still may have an impact on, again, how you cope, how your body copes with the COVID uh, virus. So we very strongly encourage um, patients to return uh, to our practices uh, for uh, proper oral hygiene uh, care. Um, we've added, we've extended our hours. Uh, we've added hygienists. We've had, um, again, a very significant number of return of patients uh, early on, and uh, we realize that there are people out there there that are still concerned about is it safe, um, and the same concerns they have about going anywhere uh, certainly apply to any setting in a healthcare setting. But again, we we take every measure um, that we can to ensure their safety, and and we feel that's important. And again, the message is that's how we we manage each and every patient. Uh, that's how each of our offices is run, um, safety first, and uh, and you need care. And um, delaying it, you run the risks, again, of other health issues and certainly uh, oral health issues that, that need to be addressed. And so we do encourage patients to come back and see us. So if one of our friends listening wanted to get in touch with you for more information about questions they may have, how can someone reach out to you? The, the best way to get in touch is, is through our website prohealthcaredental.com. I think uh, that's really the, the most effective way. Um, I'm in the Lake Success Office. Um, and again, you can, can find us uh, best that way. Um, you can also find uh, the way to engage teledentistry in that same manner. So if you have a, a question or a concern, then, then that's the way we can manage it. Thank you for being here, Dr. Bruce Falari, the Chief Officer, Dental Officer, and Director of Prostodontics at ProHealth Dental. We hope you stay safe and continue doing the great work, and thank you for being our guest today. Thank you. This is Dr. Janine Cookerod from the Nursing Department here at NASA Community College, along with student Gina Peter, and we want to thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health. We'd like to get your feedback on your family's health. Send your comments by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu. Podcasts of today's show are available on iTunes, Android Podcasts, and Spreaker. This program was produced at the studios of Nassau Community College in cooperation with the nursing department. Join us next week for another edition of Your Family's Health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.